So, uh, good morning everybody. Um, I'm Madhur and I'm, I'm part of uh, FEG DevOps team or deployment team or whatever. We recently renamed ourselves to BAD, which is Build Automated Deploy. We have BAD at FEG.com. Some cool and a lot of people can identify with us. Um, today I'm going to be talking about how we used a uh, combination of Vagrant and Puppet to uh, spawn off environments on the fly. So I might be using the word planet because uh, internally uh, we use the term planet to uh, refer to environments. So for example, the production is, is the Earth planet, um, something like stage is Mars and so on. So if I use planet, it, it sort of stands for environment. Um, okay, so with that, let's get started. So uh, brief agenda, talk briefly about what we do, what problems we were trying to solve. Uh, what did we do with those problems, uh, testing and some challenges with it. Okay, well, what does APG do? So uh, we were basically uh, an API platform. So if a customer comes and says, hey, you want to expose so many apps to the outside world, maybe for, you know, uh, for their customers or their partners, we are uh, an in, uh, a cloud slash on-premise platform. Um, and the various components, so for example, uh, the cloud platform would have an ELB and sort of receives all your traffic. So, so, so imagine it as a middle layer, right? So you have your customers and uh, you are the customer and we sit somewhere in between. So your, your customer's traffic will hit our platform first, which then goes and makes a call to, the, um, to your apps and then it gets it back, it does some transformation and then uh, gives it back. So we are that in between layer. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, so, so we do some data analytics on top of it. Uh, we take care of making sure that the call that comes in, it's transformed in the way. And so for example, let's say I have an XML data that the end call is given. So we will probably convert it to JSON and give it back. And we do some sort of caching and uh, we do rate limiting. Rate limiting is a big thing right now. And we also do some things like OAuth and so on, so that uh, you can expose out uh, in, in a secure way to your uh, end users. So having said that, the problem we've had is uh, we are completely on AWS. And, and uh, for a very long time, we've had static environments. Uh, environments spawning anywhere, uh, the size of environments would be anywhere between 60 machines to 180 machines. Um, and they would all be up all the time. So you can imagine the, the amount of money we pay AWS just because of that. Uh, and we have roughly around six product, six to seven product teams. So the challenges with that is also, so, so for example, you cannot directly come into a stage environment, right? So, so you have to go from your uh, initial and smoke environment or your first environment and then go to the next and then sort of promote the build side of your products. Problem was, if I have six to seven teams, all of them trying to, um, Deployed to the same environment, it's always going to be chaotic. Um, so, so we had to those problems for a very long time. So, I, for example, I have a new version of software and I deploy it. Someone else is actually doing testing on this and everything breaks. So that's one of the things we want to solve. Um, the second thing was self-service. Um, as of, I think the previous talk was also sort of doing something like this. Use one of your environment whenever you want, bring it up, test and then uh, bring it down. So we wanted it to be sort of self-service platform. Um, the other thing that we have, because we are also on-premise and uh, we also do some sort of hosting, we want to be able, so the choices that we wanted to use were something that would enable us to use it directly on on-premise or on any cloud. So uh, it's, it should not just be only for AWS. So more if we move to OpenStack in our private cloud or if our customers are on OpenStack, we should be able to help them. And finally, uh, we should be used by devs, pre-sales. So the pre-sales guys, uh, they have their own dedicated set of machines on AWS which they use to show stuff to the customers. And, and even things like regression, right? Regression can happen anywhere between 10 machines to 8 machines depending on what you're testing, your different product. So that was a challenge uh, we sort of uh, started with. So then we came up with something called as Autoplanet. Uh, this is how you would run the command. Um, I talk about what we are doing, but uh, so we ended up with something like this, and that took us from here to there. So uh, I, I'm guessing you can't read it, but 
So what it essentially is, is basically a sort of scripts, bundle scripts, which will give in some input, take that, pass the whole thing, create machines, uh, deploy um, software for you, and then wire the model. So I'll talk a little bit more about what we did. So, so the flow we basically follow, so we have uh, environment profiles. So for example, uh, team one can have their own profile of what are the machines that they want to spawn and what configuration they need. So on a single machine, I can have one or more applications. There are some base applications which are going to be on every machine. Someone like a regression team, for example, would come and then create a profile and the profile is all in YAML, right? So we, we have a standard defined profile, so people go and create whatever profiles they want. So the, the, the regression profile is, for example, 80 machines. So you will have 80 machines um, in, 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 in the environment. So uh, as part of the environment profile, uh, what we do is we specify uh, type of machine, what applications supposed to run, number of machines, uh, whether you want to run it on AWS or just uh, on, on, on your local laptop. So currently it, it was really well for um, a developer slash tester on um, on your laptop and on AWS. So, so the, the secret ingredient to all this is actually different. Um, so when we spawn machines, uh, we basically what we do is we take those profiles and we have a bunch of scripts which sort of creates vagrant files out of it. Um, and the vagrant file uh, uh, sort of defines what machines you want to bring up, what configuration you want to run. And I'll be showing some examples around that. Then we also run configuration and wiring part. Um, for that we use Puppet and Vagrant plugins. I'll be free to touch upon those. And at the end of it, uh, we need to test the planet. So because we use Puppet and Puppet doesn't have something like a mini test handler or whatever, the other cool tool that a lot of people are using nowadays is server spec. So server spec you define, uh, it, it's it's, it has its own DSL, but very simple, uh, written in Ruby, you can say, uh, I'll show you examples, but with that you can sort of test the whole thing. So you, for example, if I have 10 machines set up, I can have, say, based on applications, go and test each of them. So I'll talk about this. So, okay, Vagrant, uh, so in hindsight, if you were probably using Chef, I don't think we would have even used Vagrant to do all that we are doing today. So one of the problems with something like Puppet is, is, is there is no orchestrator. So people might use MCO etc, uh, M Collective, but that's more for saying okay run this on this machine. But there's nothing that will sit there and you have the same common interface that you would use to spawn off machines. So for example, Chef you would say knife EC2 create like she was talking about or knife OpenStack creates and so on. So for that we needed something and, and one of the best things that we had that we could integrate with was Vagrant. So Vagrant is this, uh, how many of you have used Vagrant? So uh, uh, a brief note on Vagrant, it's a uh, tool this guy, Japanese guy called uh, Michael Hashimoto, he came up with it. So his funda was very simple. He said, um, I'm going to write a wrapper which will sit basically on um, VirtualBox or on AWS. It's basically provider agnostic. So provider in this case would be AWS or OpenStack or even VirtualBox, right? And then I define whatever configuration I want in, in some format, right? And then I'm also going to integrate provisioners into it. So provisioners is your standard puppet, share, fanciple, solve. So you can put in whatever configuration you want there. And then when you say wait it up, the machine comes up and then you can run whatever configuration. So the provisioner thing sort of takes over. And if you have shared scripts, it will run chef. If you have puppet scripts, it will run puppet. So here, for example, um, if you look at the left side, this is a standard configuration for our zookeeper. So you have, that's the, the machine block, the machine itself is zookeeper. So you have redefined all the puppet modules and so on. Um, the interesting part there is the puppet dot factor. Um, just keep that in mind when, when I talk about puppet, I'll, I'll talk a little more about that. So the configuration in red is not going to change whether I run it in virtual box or on AWS or any other provider. So that's a cool part of it. So it means if I have uh, some script which will generate that part for me, I'm really good. Because the only thing that's actually going to change is this part. So the provider configuration based on AWS or this type of will change. But the, the base configuration that you have will always remain the same. Okay, so, so puppet, uh, problems with puppet, right? So 
so, so we run close to like 3000 servers and uh, we run roughly around 12 puppet servers okay so uh, that's a problem by itself because uh, the problem with puppet is like when you start running puppet it compiles the whole damn thing at that time on the server so the PC like crazy loads on, on our server so one of the things we wanted to do when we built something like this was to get away from that and have something that really scales well which means we go with puppet masterless so uh, once you have master list, then you have you don't have to go call or talk to a server or, or, or any such thing, right? So what we do with that is um, the guy called Jordan Sissel, who sort of initially came up with this. He's a guy who wrote uh, uh, Logstash and uh, a couple of other really cool tools. So he came up with something called as uh, two ten courses, and he was having exactly the same problems with Puppet with his right? So he said, okay, I will define a truth enforcer class. Um, so in Puppet, this, this is how we would have, you have, have classes, you can do inheritance and all those things that you would generally do with, uh, you know, your Java classes or whatever. So then he says, uh, what I'm going to do is, it's, it's called as factor based Puppet. So, so the configuration that you see here, which is the factor, so that's the part that we need to pass, okay, I should have, uh, in it, so. that's the part, so things like planet is this, applications is this, so for example, Application, what we do is we pass a JSON, which says you will have application A, B, C with all the information on that. Now, the, pro the thing that the truth enforcer does really well is that uh, you have the same, uh, you have the exact same manifest, the word for cookbook in, in, in the puppet world is manifest. So, you have the same manifest that's going to run on every single machine. So, when it runs, it will look at, uh, it's basically a whole bunch of if else, right? the testing mode then go run something else. If it has this particular application, then we call it another class. So we call the zookeeper class for example, which will go and run the zookeeper uh, manifest on it. Um, the other thing that to be learned and, and a lot of people don't do for puppet, right, is, is to have parameterized classes. It's uh, not well documented, uh, maybe the documentation is there, but if you look at general manifests, that are written, people do not use parameterized classes, that's something that, that helped us quite a bit. So we pass things like port and applications and blah blah blah. Okay, so, so, so far where have we come, right? So if I give you an environment, uh, YAML, we have a bunch of scripts which converts that into a vagrant file and then we run vagrant up, which basically brings up a whole bunch of these machines based on the configuration. Um, one quick thing I'd like to touch is, uh, we also do this multi-region thing and stuff. So, if you do multi-region, uh, our recommendation is go with uh, this AMI that Wyata has. Uh, Wyata is this company which is really good with the VPNs. Um, so, we use AWS on one end and uh, it gives you like this customer gateway that you can use. And on the other end you have Wyata and, and it's, it's, it's a free AMI. The paid one as well, but the free AMI works really well. And then once we do that, we run Puppet Master List, um, which is what I'm showing you with Max, uh, followed by Vagrant Projects. Um, so one thing that we have uh, with our applications is that uh, just because Puppet runs, at the end of the thing, it's not yet usable, which means you cannot actually send traffic. So uh, what we have to do is to actually register each of the components with, with the management component, which in turn stores its state or uniqueness in the zookeeper, right? So, so if you imagine, let's say, 20 machines which sort of come up in parallel, at the end of it, they are all configured, but you need to do this wiring part which sort of registers each one with the management part. So that part we handle well with uh, Vagrant plugins. So an example for this, and a lot of people again do not use Vagrant plugins, um, so people who are using Vagrant highly recommend you to use this, because you can learn to do whatever you want. So, uh, I've just put in a couple of samples here. So, for example, uh, we do things like vagrant RPG management wire. So, it'll it'll run a whole bunch of uh, REST API calls on the management and, and sort of wire stuff. Then you can do things like this, right? So, for example, uh, for the same zookeeper, at the end of it, if I run vagrant RPG status, we spit out a JSON which which goes and figures out the status across all the machines and see what what's up, what's not up, and so on. The other things uh, we have written which we plan to open source soon is uh, plugins for you to manage various other components. So we have plugins to manage Route 53, plugins to manage ELB, 
Um, so very simple, uh, we use the same, so, so Vagrant gives you this classes, bunch of classes, it says you inherit these providers like you would do with any standard tool and you write your own provider. So we, we use the fog API and at the back end it will do this. So Vagrant API will be this. So this one we sort of inspired from Chef, right? I'm, I'm a big Chef fan. So instead of naive ELB list, I would do a vagrant ELB list. And then in, in Chef, you would have something like knife node show and this. So similarly, you have vagrant ELB show that and will give you a lot more information about the individual ELBs or the route 53 entries or whatever. So recommendation is to use plugins. So the whole wiring part that I was talking about, it's done completely via plugins. So that's that part. Now the next part is, so where do we come so far? We have a profile, the YAML, we have some bunch of scripts which converts it into a massive vagrant file. And nobody ever really needs to look at the vagrant file, but it's it's uh, automated script you can regenerate it as many times as you want. And then we run, we spawn off the machines. Um, yeah, so if I have 18 machines, one of the problems is that uh, you do not want it to sort of do it serially. So Vagrant sort of introduced and we, we did some contribution as well to making sure that all the machines sort of come up in parallel. Um, and you can, so if I have 80, 90 machines, obviously 90 threads would drive the machine mad. So you can actually say I want to, you can define maybe 10 to 20. So we've seen that more than 15 threads and uh, AWS begins to terminate machines that, uh, that it gets created. So bring up around 12 machines at a time, 12 to 15 machines. And then we run puppet, uh, puppet masterless, and then we run the vagrant plugins. So that's four steps. The final step uh, after that is something that everybody wants to do is before they even log in is how do you test that everything is set up correctly? So for that, uh, as I said, we use server side. So, uh, so if if you look at the example, it's it's very simple, right? So you, you can say, for example, describe port, and it says it should be this thing, and describe zookeeper, it should be enabled, it should be running. So. So at the end of that, what we do is run this rake server spec. Uh, what it does is uh, at the end of the way, uh, end of the machine creation, we generate a, a JSON file which has all the uh, metadata about the, the machine, right? Right from um, right from the machine names to IP addresses to uh, port name, port numbers, and all, all those kind of things uh, in the JSON. So as part of server spec, we have a RAID file uh, that just passes out the JSON and then says, okay, these are all the Zookeeper machines, go run the Zookeeper test on the Zookeeper machine. On the management machine, go run the management test. So you can sort of uh, parallelize the whole test and it takes roughly around a 40, 40, maybe worst case, a minute to run all this and then your environment is up. Right. So we've sort of done the whole thing. So, so this is a case where the, the, the run has actually failed. So Something is wrong, so you, you need to. This is just some output that paste it. So we've covered the whole thing, right? From uh, having a simple YAML file that defines profiles for various teams, and what we've done is we help the teams by saying you fork off the branch, um, create your own profile, test it out, and set a pull request and we'll merge it. Then we create wait the file, spawn off machines, wire it up, and run tests. Okay, what are some of the challenges here? So even with this, uh, one of the things that was happening was we used to have, let's say, seven or eight different teams, so seven or eight different people from various teams spawning off their planets, and we did not know, know how to audit them and so on. So we created Jenkins job, which would sort of send us a daily report saying these are the number of machines that are running because the business is always keen over. So if I'm moving away from these static planets to something like this, how much money are we spending here, right? So. Uh, one thing we are doing now is uh, we, with EDS back instances, what you can do is uh, sort of uh, suspend them or we, we say pause. So you say dot slash auto setup, name of the planet or environment and say pause and it, it stops all the machines and next morning when you come to office you have to do a resume. Right? So by default if, if we don't get any intimation about something, every night at 11 o'clock, 11, 11.30 something. Um, the scripts runs from Jenkins and, and sort of shuts down all the plans. Okay, user data is something that's really, really interesting. Um, and I think uh, all cloud platforms have this concept because when a machine comes up, the machine has to identify itself. So, uh, 
what who am I right that, that sort of uh, information you, you can get via a curl call in, in Amazon with the 169.250 some IP one so as part of user data uh, what we do is uh, we saw things like puppet so the machine comes up we, we inject facts in it and it installs puppet and then begins to run the manifest so um, a lot of people don't do this, I don't know why, but if you are using something like AWS, uh, please go ahead and do it. And because a similar concept exists in, in, in almost all the cloud platforms. So it's some useful thing that you can do. Um, the other thing we did was there was uh, parallel execution, I've already spoken about this. The other thing was, uh, till recently they did not have the support where, uh, uh, so there's a sudo part, there's a, there's a configuration which says require DTY in your sudoers. So if you don't comment that out, uh, then you cannot SSH and run in commands there. So as part of user data, the other thing we were doing it is commenting out. So, but it all fails at that level because initially when the machine comes up, unless you have a specific AMI which already has required it by off, but the guys uh, run the standard Amazon AMI which does not have that. So we comment that out, we install puppet and everything fails. And then the provisioning part actually uses this uh, Ruby gem called parallel. You could use the GNU parallel as well to run all these jobs in, in, in parallel. And it goes and uh, then executes puppet as well. So even after that, we constantly had problems. Uh, and the problems were because, uh, so let's say I'm, I'm, I keep introducing new features, which means, uh, okay, one of the problems is that uh, the configuration files is part of your applications, right? So where do you store them? Do you store them in, in, in with your software or do you store them in a place like Puppet or Chef? Right? So um, initially uh, here in, in, in our uh, organization, we used to store all the configuration files in Puppet as templates. Now that uh, is maybe a bad idea because uh, every time you change the actual configuration here, so which means you introduce let's say a new parameter called foo, now unless you actually go and update your puppet template, next time when you deploy, let's say you install the RPM or tar.gz, it's installed, but then when puppet runs, it just overrides the whole file, right? So it's sort of crazy. Um, so there are two things to that. One is just make sure you, you maintain your whole configuration file in, in source code itself, because uh, then your puppet manifest or your chef uh, cookbook would be as simple as um, for example, installing HTTP. You could do a yum install, it will may, maybe modify a few things in your configuration file, then start it up. So, uh, we sort of moved a lot of this uh, uh, template stuff into um, the source code. But that worked really well for static planets. Now, um, I'll, I'll also touch briefly about Hira. Hira is uh, uh, hierarchical database uh, which we, you, it can be backed by just YAML files or by Redis or MySQL and it works really well with Puppet. So for example, um, Puppet does not have the notion of environments. I mean, it's there but it's not that as good as the one in Chef. In Chef, what you would do is when, when I have a new environment, I have a, a JSON file that I would just check in or an RP file. So every time it runs, a, a node runs in that environment, it picks up that. So if I have to pick up environment specific values in Puppet, the way to do it is you store those values in Hira, right? So uh, for example, I'll have based on different environments, I'll have different values. So it, when it does a Hira lookup, it picks up the, the right value. So now if you think about moving all the configuration files into your source code, um, the problem is it works really well for static values. And, and this is something that is falling off on the fly. Uh, so, which means that the higher lookups for that might not be there and even if it is there, it might have that all well. So, the thing that we went and asked people to do is uh, to go ahead and create a, a YAML file for us and the YAML file will have, uh, okay, we are company Java shop, right? So, YAML file will have the property name, it will have the file name and all the properties that need to be replaced during the runtime and the corresponding higher value. So, uh, the thing that currently works for us is the one thing that the developer has to do for a value that has to be overridden is to add a higher value and, and make an entry in this file. Because as part of puppet run, what we do is we pass out this file and, and pick and replace all the values. So, we sort of got rid of 90% of failures 
because uh, every time somebody introduces a configuration property, now it doesn't click. Um, I guess it is, it's probably an even better way to do this, so I, I guess we're just learning. But, but we've seen um, a lot more success with this because, uh, I mean, I would expect the developer to at least make one check-in into our LIDA value about what value we should pick uh, rather than not knowing anything about it. So, so that the developers themselves are aware of this. Okay, and, and finally, uh, I, I guess this is what Anotini uh, spoke as well. You need a single interface. Uh, we sort of really a fancy UI which sort of uh, does all this, but in the meantime, our uh, simple, stupid solution is to, is to sort of have Jenkins jobs. So people go create planet, take a bunch of parameters, just spawn off an environmental tests and then and give you the result. Um, I had a demo, but I'm, I'm using a shared laptop, so I can't show that to you. But yeah, any questions? I guess I'm just going to ask. Any questions around choice of technology? So no questions means you did not understand anything or you understood everything. So uh, around back, oh, yeah. uh, did you face any problems because like when we were using Badrant, I saw that it crashed around a lot and it kind of blew away environments as such. And it was very kind of unpredictable. Okay, so uh, I, I think there have been a lot of issues around that with especially virtual box on, on but uh, the new version of Vagrant with 1.4 and uh, VirtualBox 4.3 plus, uh, it's way more stable. Um, so they fixed quite a few issues. So if you look at the Vagrant log at the recent times, they have fixed quite a few issues. Uh, and uh, we run maybe two machines. Uh, the other thing is, even even on laptop, after three VirtualBox machines, the, the machine becomes really slow. Uh, so we, we saw moving to Docker and uh, stuff so that we run only two virtual machines and run maybe like seven containers spread across those two. And, and the thing is, uh, one, one thing we are doing now is, uh, Vagrant has this other provider now called Vagrant LXC. So you just want to plug this in, so tomorrow we should have, so next time if I am going to do this demo, I should probably show the Vagrant LXC. It works quite well. You yeah. mentioned both Seth and Parker. Yeah. So you work with this and typically, yeah. everyone wants to know comparison. Oh, okay, so I, I can go on for like an hour on this. So, but, but um, I, I think Chef has evolved like, way more than Puppet. Um, so the guy who started Chef, Adam Jacob and some other guy, they, they, were, they were from the core of the Puppet team, right? So one of the first things they introduced was Knife. It's the management client which Puppet does not have. And I think that made a huge difference. The other thing was that uh, Puppet says, uh, you, are, you as a user should define the order. So uh, if, if I just randomly write a manifest and, and just leave it, it can run any way. So, uh, funny thing in that is, uh, so the, we, we were like the startup and we wanted to get things out, right? So, people kept writing manifest left, right, center. And at some point of time, they missed a lot of this. Uh, so, there are roughly around 180 different modules and manifests. Uh, so, each module will have multiple manifests, sort of like cookbook and recipes, right? So, uh, they forgot, or I, I, I don't want to blame them because they have their pressures. But this ordering is not done. So we actually didn't pop it twice. So <laughs> the first time we are everybody is in a state of mind where they say, okay, first pop it run, we are not sure it's going to run. But then we run pop it again, so that it runs. So it's very, very important in, in pop it that you define the order of resources. But it's definitely like very simple. Say so top to bottom, I just adjust on it. Okay. The other thing with pop it is that um, we just had a production issue two days back, is with puppet servers. The fact that I'm running 12 puppet servers is something that I'm really not proud of. But till we move to this puppet master list completely, um, we got to do this. So uh, what it does is it compiles the whole order in memory every single time you run it. Right? And it eventually gives you like this insanely massive JSON file. So the more manifest you have, the, the, the more compilation time it takes. Whereas Chef doesn't really work. It's, it, you, Chef is already, uh, you know, it's um, it stored the state in, in the database. It, it's already there. So it, it just takes it and gives it to you. So for example, if I have 40 clients, for example, I, I mean, this is not theoretical, it's, it's, I just saw it yesterday. If I have 40, 50 clients, 
uh, which sort of go to the puppet server at the same time. It creates up like 40 threads, and if the man, if you have like 20, 30 manifests running on each, then it takes a lot of time. So we've seen like CPU go go like this, right? With the load average of something like 28. So, so the, that's another. So today, if I get somebody to start something new, I would actually tell them, hey. Um, Use Chef if you have good Ruby guys in, in your organization. Otherwise, use Ansible. Ansible is also better. Right? But don't use Puppet. <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, for our organization, eventually the move is to um, move away from Puppet. And, and uh, then we use MCO quite a bit as well. And, and uh, the problem is, um, you, so you basically have plugins in MCO where you would say MCO. So, so, it's equivalent of what you would do with Knife, right? So in Chef, you would say knife search, environment this, and web servers this. So it does a solar query for you and gives you all the stuff and does an SSH or whatever and deploys. Similarly, MC is supposed to MC, MC actually is supposed to scale better because it's a pop subject, right? So you have active MQ, it's a set of all over. Um, and it is way faster than the knife is. The problem is that uh, so we, we, we have like six regions in AWS that we sort of manage and there's a complete cluster of these active MQs, right? So it's a, each one talks to the other. So when, when I hit an MCO query, what happens is it goes to this first and then that goes to all those and that goes to all the servers. So which means, so, so the way MCO works is that every time I make an MCO query, it will really go to every machine. So if you see the log on the, on the, on the client, you'll actually see, hey, are you this guy? And the answer is no. So it has to return back to the queue on, on active MQ and, and eventually has to come out. So we had a lot of issues with MCO at scale, more than 2000 plus machines, where um, you do an MCO query and it actually gives you only maybe around 70, 80 percent of uh, the actual number of nodes. So 100 nodes in UAE or 90. Right, so um, that's the other problem of orchestration with this. So, Knife, for example, does not do it. It just goes and looks at its database. It's a solar query, and, and Chef 11 is way more stable, and then gives you the, the nodes. SSH is lower, that is true, but uh, it's more reliable. So, uh, here we want to go to, um, so eventually, someday, I, I guess, six months from now, we completely get rid of Puppet. Um, today, already we, we've started using Ansible, so maybe we'll submit the root conf log as to how we are using Ansible with Puppet. So we do a lot of our orchestration tasks with Ansible and it works quite beautifully. Uh, but the Puppet server thing with two runs is still a problem because uh, when you bring up a new machine today, what happens is uh, the machine comes up in like two minutes, but for the machine to be actually ready, it, it takes another 12 minutes. So it's a 14 minutes because we run two Puppet runs. <laughs> And <laughs> so you run puppet engine minus T and you wait for like three minutes for the run to start because it takes so much time for you to compare. You will not face this with maybe around 100 nodes. 100, 500 nodes, I think, uh, where you puppet chef, puppet plus MCO should handle the, all your cases. But once you go beyond 2000, etc., everything will crawl. So that's when you say, if you're using puppet, go and master this. So one of the things we're trying to do is, uh, and in fact, a lot of people have done this as well. So you come into Git, as a post committer, push all of it to S3. And when the machine comes up, you have a user data thing which goes and downloads all the stuff from S3 and just runs it. Right? That's a, sort of the right model to follow if, if you're using something like Puppet. And have some other system which, which gets you all the nodes and you know, like puts it into Nagios or whatever monitoring. That's, that's a, another thing that everyone does, right? Which is um, make sure that uh, every time my monitoring system runs, um, it, it updates or removes the nodes which have been removed or added. So those kind of things you'll have to do a little more with something like a puppet. Quick follow-up, sir. Knife EC2 doesn't now support spot instances. I haven't seen when the last sort of six to eight months was happened on Knife EC2. But does it support spot instances? Like launch spot. Earlier, there was only fog that allowed you to work with spot instances. I think that I saw a comment a couple of months back around it. I have not. So since I came here, I have not worked much. I guess it has support though. Uh, in fact, that's probably a good opportunity for you to contribute back. <laughs> So, so 
when we have like VPC public private, we have a NAT instance in between. Now when I connect US West to US. So to connect those across to the other zone, you know, we want to have a private sort of a thing. So for example, if I have two zookeepers sitting here and, and two, two zookeepers sitting in another zone, the ideal way to do that, because both are in private, the private part of the NAND, the ideal way to connect them is to have a sort of a VPN between the two. If not face any conversation. The only thing that you have to monitor is Vayaka. Because, so, so one end Amazon already gives you like this customer gateway and you sort of get the con. So, you can actually say if, like what is my other end point? If it's Cisco, it gives Cisco configuration. If it's Wireta, it gives you Wireta. Copy paste that to that. Make sure it's always up. That's the only challenge. So, uh, the older versions of Wireta apparently had issues. There's another company, some Pulse Sense or something, which also does something similar. Um, so your only problem is to make sure that VPN is sort of uh, up and running. And earlier it was non-stable. People used to run two Linux boxes and have open VPN and make sure it's there. That's definitely something you can do. But uh, at least for test and run, by the way, we also run real time products. So it's run really well for the last one year. We've used version like 6.5 point something, 64-bit. So it's quite, quite stable. Yes. Vagrant is my orchestrator here. No, no, no. Puppet will only run on the box. Puppet has no idea what on the outside. Puppet is only on the box. Puppet is your chef client. Chef hyphen client will get some state and run it on the box. I need something which controls it. Which is why I was talking about MCO, right? People use MCO to control it from outside. So Vagrant is almost like my provisioner. Sorry, my orchestrator. No. You have okay. People have written some plugins around it, but uh, I, I have not seen much use of those. It's no, it is not orchestration. It, it primarily it was best as a configuration man. Another? No, no, no. So Zookeeper is a software code. I, I just picked up Zookeeper because it's something that's agnostic to uh, any of our internal components. So it's it's like think of it like a HTTP. It's just another machine. And this I just picked that so that I, I could I could take one component run you through right from configuration to test. It can as well be your web server engine. Yeah, so you bring up the machine, have, have scripts which will just uh, pull. How, how do you communicate to the VMs inside the VMs? If, if that is not having a... Oh, okay. So we run all of this, so you can do all of this. That's a good question. So you can actually do a, have a jump server from where you run all of this. This is what we typically do. But the other thing you could also do is have on, on your NAT instance, you can set up an open VPN server. And from your local box, you can have those certificates here and you can connect to it. So that now you are in the exact same subnet as the public permit and then you can run this. So you can do it both ways. Yeah. Once, once you are in the VPN, it's, uh, whether it's private and it's or not, it doesn't really matter. You are on the same net. But, so jumpers will be the public subnet of the VPC if you are using that. So two ways to do it.